Thank you so much. I was told that I'm not supposed to be a moving target for practical reasons, so I will try to be as immobile in my bodily uh, expression, <laughs> but I will compensate. I promise. I will, I will compensate dearly. So uh, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, thank you, thank you, Dirk, for, uh, for the invitation. And also, I, would, I must say that I'm very thankful for having the possibility of showcasing some of the, uh, the interesting and cool stuff that one can do with, uh, with uh, RAT, with a rat. Uh, very, very quickly, as, as Dirk was saying, indeed, I'm coming from Lund University, but I'm a bit of a, a different kind of, of, uh, of animal, if you wish, uh, in, in the academia, in the academic fauna. Uh, I am at this stage in my career in which I have a, a very uh, a hat of all sorts of hats, yes. Uh, I'm a, a senior lecturer, and I've just gotten my permanent position, finally, uh, after a, a, a rather uh, long road. Uh, and my, uh, as you can see, my expertise basically is slightly different than the previous, uh, from the previous speakers. I'm from social sciences. And more specifically, from I have a background in uh, political science, so I'll be very uh, excited and interested in the next uh, talk as well. But my uh, expertise is basically looking at uh, politics from a gender perspective in a very, very, very general way of, uh, of uh, putting these things. And of course, as we notice in here, uh, you see I have a long line also of uh, things that I'm indebted to. Yes, so I have. Uh, managed to do the sort of research that I'm doing, also thanks to the continuous application mail uh, of things. Uh, this, is, this is the truth. And this uh, research is part of my ongoing research project on the extreme right metapolitical project in the digital age. Uh, of course, very, very quickly about the disposition of this presentation. So as I said, the talk today is based on, a, on, a, on an outcome that is already published in a special issue that I have also co-edited. Uh, and uh, the study I have done, it was together with, uh, with uh, Dirk. And it was very, very uh, rewarding. Uh, very little today, but very quickly, I will walk you through, but in a very deep, how to say, I have a lot of text on my slides, but you do not need to get stuck onto those. It's just more like, you know, for me, uh, uh, ways of remembering what I would like to, 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 to lift up in, uh, in the talk. But I, very quickly, I will touch upon the the theoretical framework of, uh, of the study, also because I'm still a political scientist at heart, so I'm still a bit squarish and I need boxes to feel comfortable. Also a bit of a cat uh, from that uh, point of view. <laughs> uh, so a bit touching on, on issues of critical uh, data studies, and you will notice in a second why I'm making this very clearly from the very beginning, that it's critical data studies that I'm interested in, uh, touching upon issues of uh, digital uh, inequality and the dynamics of politics of exclusion that are uh, my, my, my interest. And of course, finally hitting the, the, the interesting part of this, uh, this whole thing is the Google search algorithms and data voids. And then, of course, uh, they're diving into the method and data, and then discussing the results uh, and fleshing out the two uh, uh, cases that we had, the context of uh, Germany and uh, Sweden, respectively. And if there is still some time left, uh, I will be having some rushed concluding remarks and a bit of advertising for both the special issue and the article with nice uh, QR codes that you can scan. Uh, <clears throat> so the dynamics of exclusion in the aftermath of 2014, uh, 15 uh, humanitarian crisis, the Swedish case. As we are approaching elections in both uh, European level, but also we see how, how, how the, the situation is quickly developing in the German context, uh, it seems that the alt-right or the far-right or the extreme-right is on the rise in, uh, in, both, uh, in both countries. Uh, in here we see how uh, there seems to be a certain uh, IKEA model of assembling these, uh, uh, these things. And I thought it was uh, a better irony to, to, to see this illustrated in, in this way. And I thought that it would be a good way to, to call this into attention. Uh, unfortunately, Sweden had developed from, from, from being an epitome of a a welfare model country of, in which equality was something that everyone strived for, uh, at the moment uh, that it uh, seems to be uh, less of a priority. And in turn, uh, it's more, much more of this, uh, uh, well, basically, uh, a rather, a rather anti-immigrant, uh, xenophobic uh, approach to uh, uh, how the society develops. But I say, at the same time, as I was saying, this is not something isolated, unfortunately, the Swedish case, it also happens 
uh, here in Germany, and I know perhaps you know much better, and perhaps some of you have also experienced this uh, uh, firsthand, and I, I apologize for the topic of this thing, but I think it is important to be able to talk uh, about these issues, even as uh, researchers. Yeah? Uh, however, when we do this sort of things, Again, I feed into this issue of, of critical data studies, yes, so not only doing the, the, the techy things, the exciting stuff because we can do it, but also I would argue we have a certain responsibility as researchers of being aware of how we are positioned when we're doing these studies, how do we design the studies that we are doing, uh, and also the, the impact that this might, have, might be having down the road on uh, either to the subjects of our studies or creating, if you wish, some sort of a vortex that might be having an effect uh, on, uh, on this issue. And of course, in here, since I'm, a, as you notice, I, I, I work in the Department of Gender Studies at the moment, of course, that I have added this, uh, the, the, the seven imperatives of data feminism, yes, so examining power, challenging power, and I'm not very good at emotion, but I'm using emotion as an, as an analytical lens to, 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 to study issues. And of course, I'm rethinking these binaries of hierarchies and also embracing pluralism. And you would be the judge of it if I have, and to get a bit dirty, uh, if we have managed to live up to these, uh, to these very high uh, uh, standards of, of doing research. But then uh, enough of that. What we try to do is exactly looking at these issues of digital inequalities, because I would argue that previously what, what classically was considered to be an inequality, yes, so we were talking about, you know, you have an intersectional lens, and then you look at, you know, differences in gender, in sexuality, in religion, in race, social class, and so on and so forth. I think also digital inequalities are becoming more and more important. We need to acknowledge that they play a role uh, in that context. Uh, and what we wanted to do in the study was basically to see how migrants and particularly issues or connected to the, to the topic of migration and to the humanitarian crisis of 2015 were connected exactly to these stereotypical framings of migrants. Yeah? So there have been previously uh, some, some studies, but we wanted to do it in a, in a slightly new context because as uh, Dirk was already mentioning in his opening speech, there is a lot of worm about you know, social media studies and social media studies and they have all the answers on Twitter. And perhaps this uh, article is also an attempt to balance that, uh, that idea that well, only Twitter is something worth analyzing or only social media. And we say, what if we move the lens and we look at Google? And why we, do, we want to do that? Well, also because this idea that Google in a way is sort of neutral, yes? So the search engines seem to be neutral because they just provide you with the results, yeah? And we say, well, is it really so? Or should we actually be a bit more skeptical about what does it actually mean Googling, yeah, and all that stuff, you know, about trusting what is delivered to you and how that is invested with a certain legitimacy without going down the line and saying, well, how much of that trust is actually lived up to by the search engine itself and the algorithm that is deploying. Uh, and then, of course, uh, what we focused on in our study was exactly this issue of data voids. And for those of you who are not really familiar with the concept, the data voids is exactly a, a place, if you wish, uh, in which the quality of information is not necessarily the, 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 the highest, and then it can be very easily filled with all sorts of, uh, Ulf was, uh, was mentioning earlier, poisoned information, if you wish, or some sort of information that can be used, in our case, for uh, radicalizing and radical right uh, uh, purposes. Interestingly enough, this sort of uh, studies have previously done only in the US context. So then we thought, oh, we're having here a fantastic opportunity because we join our minds together and we can do something really novel and really interesting and then we had this comparative framework you know, between uh, uh, Germany and uh, Sweden. Though the, the, the differences between the two countries is significant and will play a role later on as you will see. Uh, I am on the methods, yes. So in here is very, very easily, uh, you see how, how we, we run our uh, uh, the, the, the search, what we were deploying for, for the thing, and also why we decided to do, and here's an explanation, why we decided to do it only on, uh, on Google as a, as a search engine. Well, basically because they have a monopolizing in both countries, they are monopolizing the market, yeah? I mean, with 90% uh, the market dominance, I know I'm, I'm talking very economistic terms, but this is, this is the truth, yes? So it's 90% dominance in Germany and 93 in Sweden. So basically you cannot really go around 
uh, uh, without uh, ending up on searching for information on Google. What we did when we designed our study, we were interested in, as I said, this existence of data voids. And since it would have been rather difficult to design data voids at national level, so we say, well, let's focus on the municipality level and see how that potential for data voids might be uh, uh, materializing. Also because Google is trying to clean up its act, or at least when they are caught, they try to clean up their act, to be more specific. So uh, we say, well, let's see what is left. Yeah, we know that it's very unstable, it's very fluid, and things can change very, uh, uh, very quickly. So then we focused on 2,055 municipalities in Germany and the 290 uh, municipalities in Sweden. It's a bit of a difference in there already. And then we designed a catalog of queries in the sense that you know, we wanted to see if we would use a specific vocabulary ranging from, let's say, more or less neutrally mainstream to the further to the right and then ending up into the radical right, how we could use that combination, again, you know, keywords of municipality plus those, uh, that uh, catalog of queries and seeing how do we wander further to the, to the, to the right and also what sort, of search, what sort of results we might be getting in that, uh, in that case. In order to be able to do this query, we relied extensively on the work of, of mapping the far right uh, activity uh, done by Amadeo Antonio Foundation in uh, Germany, but also by Expo in, uh, in the Swedish case. So in here you have a very quick uh, idea about what, how we did, we did with the classification. Yeah? So the queries, the levels, and in here we've been mindful to the specificities of the, each political culture in each country. Yeah, so things that might be impacting, because one observation that I would like to make already in here is that perhaps even at the level of mainstream, the way the phenomenon is described in the German context might be slightly stronger than, for instance, in the Swedish context. Or at least it was when we did our study. I'm not really sure that this might be valid nowadays. But for that purpose, we you know, identified you know, the, level, the three levels and in ways that it will be ranging from the more mainstream ways of describing the events, uh, as you can see in, uh, in, uh, in there, to the more uh, radicalizing, radical right, uh, uh, <clears throat> a populist manner, all the way to the far right and extreme right environment, yes. Uh, and I, again, I apologize for the, for the very rough uh, and, and very, uh, yes, very offensive ways of, of uh, uh, phrasing these things, but we thought it was very important to be able to do this uh, sort of thing. And then, as you can see, our queries and our search with the, with the, with the RAT-generated data set, it varies also significantly in the two countries. It's also because of the size of the, uh, of the two. Then, to give you an idea very quickly, because I do not want to speak uh, only myself. So as you can see in here, when we uh, organize, also we have the 10, yeah, so we did the classical 10 results fold. So which were the top 10, uh, 10 results in each category uh, for, each, uh, for each level. And then, as you can see in, uh, in the table above, uh, in the category, uh, in the level A, it was not anything too surprising. Yeah, so usually you have the sources are uh, social media platform, document sharing platform, online encyclopedia, but mainly governmental sites and, and so on and so forth. So that sort of vocabulary seems to be deployed by mainly what you would think as trustworthy mainstream uh, uh, sources. As we wander down the, 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 the levels, we see that things change. Yes, already at level B, we have this PI News, uh, which is an extreme right news platform that is coming up quite, uh, quite high. Yeah, it's on the, fifth, uh, on the fifth position in the German, uh, these are the German results. And then uh, when you go uh, even one level lower, you see that PI News actually jumps the, 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 the ranking and it's already on first. Uh, so that tells you that that combination of municipality and the keywords that we were particularly interested in resonates extremely with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with these things. And you have both PI News but also Refugees, uh, another extreme right website on, uh, on, that, uh, on that level. And then when you uh, switch to the Swedish context, you see that flashback, surprise, surprise, uh, is uh, showing up in those, uh, in those things uh, in there. And I want to make uh, an explanation. Flashback, it seems to be the place where the free word is reigning supreme, yeah? Uh, free word having a very interesting connotation in terms of, you know, particularly what it is allowed, mainly to the extreme right and so on, rather than free as in the terms of, you know, a, a marketplace of ideas, if you wish. And again, we notice the same, uh, the same thing of, of uh, classification. In the level A, it's mainly governmental sources. It's 
what you would you call and expect it as, as being mainstream uh, sources. But as you uh, travel down the, the, the classification on level uh, B, you see that the flashback is showing up already on position eight, and then in level C is jumping uh, in hierarchy. Uh, and then we have also a, a so-called uh, immigrant critical personal blog taking a, a rather high ranking in, uh, in uh, the thing. And then we did another thing with the GNI co coefficient in which we were trying to assess the, uh, how, uh, wait a bit, now I have to remember if I say it correctly. So uh, exactly the source concentration. So the higher the source concentration, so the closer to one, you will see that they were like higher concentration. The lower the GNI coefficient will be that you'll be at like lower source concentration, which means that you will have a, more, a greater variety of sources. Uh, and as you can see already in this, uh, this graph, so as you look for the, for the three levels, Things are, we have first aggregated in the first, uh, in the first column, and then you know disaggregated for each keyword for each category. And you see how this thing varies. This is the German, uh, this is the German uh, uh, contracts, and you see how it, ge it gets, uh, if you wish, it gets steeper, uh, the, the thing, from the higher up towards the, the, the lower one. In the second one, it is a bit more confusing in the, in the Swedish contracts, and there uh, we see that this thing is, uh, to a certain degree, less clear in that, uh, in, uh, in that context, which also made us uh, uh, think a bit, what would, be the what would be the implications of that? And perhaps if we want to connect this also to, to another thing, and perhaps to, if, you, if you remember my uh, interventions earlier today, is also the thing that perhaps also this study shows the limitations and the level of ambition that we can have with uh, uh, even a critical big data analysis. Yeah? So it will be perhaps an interesting way to, 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 to do a, a follow-up in which we'll have a, a more qualitative lens to see what is going on in those uh, uh, at that level. And then the concluding remarks before I stop uh, bothering you uh, uh, speaking on this issue. So we noticed first that we saw a clear dominance of the official sources in the level A queries. Then another aspect that we found it interesting was also that the user-generated content was also highly ranked. And this also made us thinking because we did not go, as I said, we did not go in a qualitative lens in examining what has been going, what has been provided by those. However, we noticed that actually Google lends legitimacy, so they trust, if you wish, these uh, user-generated content platforms trust them, trust them more, regardless if that, the quality of that content that is on those might be indeed of a high, uh, of a, of a high quality or not. Yeah? So to put in more plain English, uh, Google might be indicating a, a, a link to a Facebook, uh, uh, to a Facebook uh, uh, comment as something that is trustful, trustworthy. However, that uh, Facebook update might be also highly racist or highly biased. But with the, within the parameters of our study, we couldn't really assess that uh, in, for, for, for certain. And then, of course, as I was saying, that we saw a, a clear increase in the GNI coefficient from level A to level C. Uh, and also, in here, we became aware of also the, the, the ethical implications of our approach. Because there's also this important aspect that it, it has been a discussion among, among the two of us uh, to become aware to which degree our queries might have actually helped these, uh, uh, these sort of uh, searches and these sort of combinations of, uh, of, of keywords might actually help them to, to, to kind of, you know, climb up on the, on, the, on the Google hierarchy and then showing up suddenly for people that actually had no intention whatsoever to, to use that, uh, that sort of thing. So this is something that uh, uh, perhaps with this ethical observation we, we can take it further. And then I think I will stop here with presenting you this fantastic uh, QR codes that you could scan and then will direct you to uh, one to the, to, the, to the article that I uh, co-authored with, uh, with Dirk, and the other one to the introduction to the special issue. So that is setting the main framework of, uh, of our, I don't remember which one is what, so I'm sorry. Uh, uh, it's just uh, the, the introduction is also having a comment also looking at how things have developed uh, in, uh, when it comes to Google critique and uh, intervention in the European context. And with this said, uh, I open up for questions. Thank you.